As teachers, we have all witnessed the moment in our class when a student made a decision that caused us to ask, why in the world did they do that? Well, today, I'm going to answer that question and explore options of how to teach our students to make optimal choices. The brain is sectored into five parts, the cerebellum, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and the frontal lobe. We'll be focusing on the frontal lobe's responsibilities. The frontal lobe controls our speaking, memory, judgment and thinking, movement, as well as our behavior. We will be focusing on judgment and thinking, or the decision-making process. This is the procedure we follow in our brains when we need to make a decision, and this flow chart created by the American Speech Language Hearing Association is for someone with a frontal lobe brain injury. Our students learn about ethics through their parents and us, their teachers. Many times, my students struggle with identifying the difference between what is right and wrong and how they should proceed in their ethical dilemma. When a child comes to me with a problem, I coach them through this exact process. Part of maturing is how a child responds to situations, and teachers play an integral part in guiding them through solutions. When scientists look for the cause of a mental illness, they look back at the brain from birth to adulthood because the brain changed as children grow. The teen years are when major changes take place. MRI scans show the shift from the younger, more active brain synapses, which is demonstrated with the red and yellow coloring, to the more mature, efficient synapses, the blue and purple areas. In adolescence, gray matter is more frequent. Gray matter is shown in the diagram as the red coloring. Gray matter is more frequent because the neural connections are pruned, meaning gray matter consists of cells that process information. Children are sponges for learning for this exact reason. Gray matter starts to thin around puberty due to the increase of cognitive abilities. It is at adolescence when kids are more likely to have an increase in desire for risk-taking because the part of the brain that controls emotions and impulses, the frontal lobe, is not mature yet due to the change in growth taking place from the back to the front of the brain. At around age 16, the brain is still developing, so it is more sensitive to drugs and alcohol. With the combination of sensitivity and the heightened desire for risk-taking, it makes sense as to why teen deaths related to drugs and alcohol are so elevated. By age 20, the changes drugs and alcohol cause are likely to stay and become programmed as addiction. How is this relevant to me in the classroom? Well, to quote the National Institute of Mental Health, the more we learn, the better we may be able to understand the abilities and vulnerabilities of teens and the significance of this stage for lifelong mental health. So when our students are having highs and lows, we need to remember that a lot of change is taking place under the surface. And if we, the adults, understand this information fully, we can create an environment which will accommodate our students' needs in and out of the classroom. Some of the best ways to set up a healthy environment is to establish an appropriate and trustworthy relationship with the students. If a child feels comfortable coming to you with their problems and their struggles, then they already know that there's a safe environment where they can express their vulnerabilities. One area that seems to heighten in our students' behavior is suicide. I conduct an activity with my 8th grade kids called Challenge Day, where my students step up to a line on the floor when a statement pertains to them. The statements are very innocent in the beginning, but shift to a heavier content later. While doing this, I found over 60% of my 98th grade students have contemplated suicide, while just under 10% admitted to having a suicide plan or attempting suicide. I have always wanted to know why and where does this decision come from, so I started to think about the issues students may battle. These are brain scans showing activity. The red signals high activity, while the other colors decrease in activity from yellow, green, to blue. The normal brain on the left shows red evenly distributed throughout the brain. The brain with OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder shows extreme activity in particular areas, meaning there is much higher activity because the brain is always on. Previously, I had a student with this disorder and he would become so hyper-focused on one minor detail that he could not function for the rest of the class until he had fixed or made that tiny area perfect. Depression is also another thing that I have never fully understood because teaching teenagers has always allowed me to attribute everything to hormones since they run rampant in our halls. In the scan, though, you can see one area is tremendously alert because they are fixated on something while the rest of the brain may be shutting down. 
The next subject is something that we are all very familiar with nowadays, ADHD. In the center of the brain, the control subject has a higher activity level for a focus, while the ADHD cannot concentrate. So all those teachers who continuously think a child just needs a little bit more discipline may need to look at these scans. The next area is of interest to me because I had a student who was morbidly obese this past year. He had an IEP, poor hygiene, and no motivation when it came to school. In the center of the brain scans, there are two lima bean-looking shapes. This is the pleasure center, and the normal brain shows areas of red, meaning the person has the ability to feel happy. The two brains on the right signal a decrease in the ability to feel joy or pleasure. The obese brain mirrors the cocaine brain because they are both searching for pleasure and objects, food, or cocaine. One could even say that sugar acts as the cocaine for an obese human, which leads me to the question if I should be using candy for positive reinforcement. These two scans show when a student is consistently exposed to media violence. Their brain activity dramatically decreases. In the world we live in today, there is violence all around us, from video games, movies, even the news. I grew up in a pretty sheltered home, and these brains prove that there is nothing wrong with that. So as a teacher, how can I help my students who are battling these struggles? Well, meditation is one way. Now, I know I cannot stop my English class to meditate. However, I can show my students helpful strategies for reducing stress and taking time to reflect. My school gives advisory class for all students the last 30 minutes of the day. Some days, my kids and I perform yoga so they can decompress. I have been thinking that it clears the mind and reduces activity so they can relax. However, this brain scan shows that brain activity actually heightens during meditation. The frontal lobes, the area responsible for decision making, is actually stimulated more. Not only does it affect our mind, but it changes the way the brain works, meaning I may need to increase our amount of yoga and reflection to a weekly happening. Whole brain teaching is another method that can help. This is a class management tool that is extremely effective. It is broken down into simple steps for teachers to use. The first step is the attention getter. The teacher says class and the students respond yes. This is a common thing for teachers. We just use variations of it. In my drama class, I say drama and they say llama. It's fun and our thing that only they use, so it's special. But why is it so effective? The neocortex, the part of your brain located behind your forehead, controls decision-making. The neocortex is the manager organizing the brain for difficult jobs. When a teacher says class and the students say yes, the teacher has focused their neocortex on what he or she will say next. The second step are class rules, and there are to be five of them. These can be adapted to any way the teacher wants, but they should be short and concise. Elementary students are suggested to use repetition of the rules in the mornings, after lunch, and after all recesses. The brain learns in five ways, seeing, saying, hearing, doing, and feeling. When the rules are taught, our students' brains are functioning to the fullest. Step three is teach okay. The most active learning happens when students occupy the brain's primary cortices, visual, auditory, language, and motor. We all know teachers talk way too long, and we lose the attention of our students. The answer is power instruction, talking in chunks of 30 seconds to one minute. Class is then divided into groups of two. Students should do majority of the teaching. When the power instruction is finished, the teacher claps two times and says, teach. The students then clap twice and say, okay. The students take turns teaching each other. Scoreboard. It's a game that acts as a motivator for performing the procedures of the whole brain teaching well. This game should be adapted to the appropriate grade level you teach. Next is hands and eyes. When you want your kids to pay close attention to something, you say hands and eyes. And the kids repeat, hands and eyes, fold their hands, and stare intensely. Step six is mirror. The teacher says mirror. The students repeat and mimic the teacher's actions. This works best when telling a story, directions, describing stages, or showing procedures. And lastly is switch. During step three, teach okay, some students talk non-stop. So saying switch allows the other students time to teach also. Whole brain teaching focuses the students away from their struggles and makes their efforts more efficient. To see all these steps in progress, I have a clip of a high school classroom using whole brain teaching.
place. You've got to figure out where the longitude line meets the latitude line, and that gives you exact location. When we look at a brain that is listening to a lecture, we see only two areas are stimulated. But with the whole brain teaching, multiple areas of the brain are engaged and focused. Students are not just mimicking actions, they are making decisions to learn with a full capacity. The bottom line is parents and teachers play a vital role in children's lives because the window for development of the brain is limited between adolescence and adulthood. Connections are constructed and fortified through experience, new physical and mental abilities, and healthy love and support from us, parents, and teachers. So if we want our students to have high-quality decision-making processes, it depends on us to guide them through this ever-changing process that takes place until adulthood. And feel free to check out the sources where I gleaned my information from.